And so all of these variations uh, in complexity, you know, exist over many magnitude scales. You know, there's some magnitude fives, which are perfectly planar, and some magnitude fives, which have, you know, 20 different little faults that were involved. So I think uh, looking at this sort of complexity is really important because to me, it happens at, at most scales. Um, and one of the problems with this type of observational sort of seismology problem is that uncertainty exists in all of the observations that we have. So you really need to consider that when you're looking at things like stress drop or focal mechanisms or anything else. Um, so what I do, uh, like starting from even my master's degree at New Mexico Tech and my, bath and my PhD at uh, UNR is looking at uh, sequences of earthquakes and uh, clusters of micro seismicity and trying to use that to look at the fault geometries and complexity in the subsurface. And, um, you know, towards the end of my PhD, I got more into source physics and thinking about how that relates to the frequency radiation of these earthquakes or to what we sort of try to measure and call stress drop. Um, oops. Okay. So the Walker Lane is this um, study area that I'm looking at in Western, uh, uh, in the Western um, US. So uh, everybody knows about the San Andreas fault system, right? And then some of the motion comes up through the uh, Walker Lane, which is basically between the Basin and Range and the Sierra Nevada uh, tectonic block. And it's this wide discontinuous zone of uh, faulting and it has all these uh, moderate magnitude earthquakes in it. Um, right here I'm showing I think only magnitude four plus for around 10 or 12 years. And um, the seismicity in there is transtensional. So we get a lot of extensional earthquakes and we get a lot of right lateral earthquakes uh, that are aligned with the San Andreas Fault. So Northwest sort of strike slip. And then we also get East West or sort of Northeast uh, striking left lateral as well. So the, com the faulting in here is pretty complex. And if you're familiar with any of like Steve Wisnowski's work, um, he talks a lot about the different mechanisms for accommodating the shear through this uh, sort of discontinuous broken area. So one of the interesting areas is the mine of deflection. This is a big right step in the Walker Lane. And so I kind of have the boundaries of the Walker Lane uh, dashed out with these dots and um, the seismicity from around 20 years or so, actually, 40 years or something is in here. Um, and uh, so there's some mag uh, magnetic and sort of volcanic seismicity over here by Long Valley Caldera, and there's some pretty young volcanics in there. And then as you get into the uh, sort of minor deflection where we have these east-west striking um, sort of left lateral faults that uh, that step over, um, you get uh, different clusters of seismicity that behave quite differently. So even in this very small area, you can see 30 kilometers is this uh, scale on the bottom left of the map. We have um, a bunch of seismicity that's happened over a long duration and in a lot of different uh, sort of sequence um, characteristic uh, different with different sequence characteristics is what I'm trying to say. So um, one example of that is the really recent uh, magnitude six and a half 2020 uh, Monte Cristo range earthquake, which was a main shock after shock sequence. It didn't have any four shocks really even close to the area, as you can see by the color scale here. And then uh, in 2011, we had this really long duration five month uh, earthquake swarm, which had maybe eight magnitude 4.7s to 4.9s, so or 4.8. So it had a lot of earthquakes around the same magnitude over a long duration. And then just next door to that is the Nine Mile Ranch sequence in 2016, which was a multiplet sequence. Within um, a, a couple of hours or days, I'm not sure, there was, I think it was hours or minutes actually, there was three magnitude five plus earthquakes. So these co-main shocks. So those are really quite different uh, behavior all in the same sort of area and in these shallow crustal parts. And so one of the reasons I'm interested in this sort of moderate magnitude seismicity, um, especially for Nevada and Eastern California, is because it happens a lot more often than the magnitude seven and a half, right? Like there's, there's not that frequent that we get large earthquakes here, but we often get swarms with a lot of magnitude fives. And if these were happening right under where people live, they would obviously be of really, uh, really important to society. So so um, there's good reasons to sort of study this. And then also from a scientific point of view, how do these relate to the, to the faults? And as you can see, like these ones are happening off of mapped faults. Even the Monte Cristo range, this is a magnitude six and a half earthquake, and it happened off of mapped uh, surface faults. So if we're only using the surface geology to do seismic hazard, it's really not giving us the full picture of kind of what's going on seismotectonically. So there's a few kind of... Uh, 
earthquakes um, that have happened in the Walker Lane um, that, that have really complex geom geometry that I want to point out. So this is the Ridgecrest earthquake um, uh, that you guys probably have heard about in 2019. It happened in the southern Walker Lane, obviously on the California side, but um, it's still this whole transtensional zone. And uh, a lot of times we get this orthogonal faulting where the left lateral fault goes first, and then we have a larger right lateral fault rupturing. So this pattern has been seen multiple times. And what I I like about this video from David Shelley is like the holes that you can see in the seismicity. So one of the other questions I'm interested in is why, you know, is there variation in seismicity along the fault plane and what does it mean about the fault, you know, actually about the fault zone. So I'm kind of trying to point out here the, that there's significant variation along the fault in the places the seismicity happens, the concentration, the magnitudes, and we get these holes, of course. And that's been seen in, in a lot of studies uh, from lab scale up to, up to, uh, um, you know, on the mega thrust, you can see these sort of mogi donuts. So this is a, an observation from the 60s, right? As soon as we started getting earthquake observations, people saw that the aftershocks occurred around the like big patches of slip that were inferred from the main shock, that kind of a thing. And so what I'm saying is we're seeing this on these smaller scales as well. So this is the, on the left is the Chalfon um, sequence. It had a magnitude 5.7 that occurred one day before a magnitude 6.3. So again, complex spatiotemporal evolution. And um, this is the inferred sort of rupture or fault plane with the dashed line. And you can see most of the seismicity is concentrating around the outside and that it has multiple fault planes and uh, complexity uh, at depth. And then these other old pictures on the right are showing the Round Valley sequence, which is also in the Walker Lane um, down by Long Valley Caldera. And it also had a foreshock um, of around a magnitude three that happened a couple seconds before the 5.8 and it had a conjugate or sort of orthogonal faulting as well. And again, the seismicity sort of forming a donut around what we infer as the patch. So what I'm working on is creating a database of these high resolution integrated studies that I think are necessary to investigate the phenomenon of basically fault complexity and sequence complexity. And these are really important in areas like Nevada and Eastern California, where there's really complex faulting. And also at the end of the talk, I'm going to relate it back to Italy um, and some of the complex faulting that you guys have there and some work that um, uh, Giovanna Calderoni has done um, with stress drops. So. What I'm going to show are a few examples of these integrated seismicity studies and how they capture these details that I think need to be addressed. You know, um, modeling and theoretical science and stuff needs to uh, appreciate or accept the fact that observations have come a long way and there's a level of complexity that needs to be sort of cataloged or classified, in my opinion. Um, so again, I'm exploring the connection between fault complexity, sequence complexity, and source complexity. Um, Oops, okay. So uh, I'm just gonna quickly go through some methods I use to apply here. Most of these are open source. Some of them I've developed or altered myself. So, um, you know, this is just showing relocation. You, if you have a sequence that has a lot of events, you can take advantage of their waveform similarity and you can correct, you know, uh, errors in the velocity uh, structure basically that you use to do the locations by, you know, uh, using the difference between them. So this was developed, you know, 20 years ago by Walthauser and Ellsworth using HypoDD, and then a lot of other authors have developed other ways to do uh, waveform-based, cross-correlation-based uh, relocations like Broclust. Um, I will say like a trade-off exists with Broclust that you often lose a significant amount of the events. Whereas if you do HypoDD and you do the sort of the catalog pairing and you do some absolute relocation first, you can usually preserve more events. So depending on what your priority is, do you really want the best results and only the finest structure? Or do you want the seismicity that may be off of faults that isn't correlating well? You know, you have to think about that when you do these sorts of studies. Another um, a uh, method that I apply to these studies is to sort of objectively split them up into different faults or into different structures. So the way that I do that is by applying um, a statistical clustering algorithm developed by uh, Zelyapin and Ben Zion, um, which relies on the source, uh, the space-time magnitude distances or the space-time distances between events. And uh, essentially, you can apply this to um, uh, 
to some individual sequence or to like a broad area to split out clusters and then use those clusters to look at individual uh, characteristics of, in, of like a fault, if it happened to represent a fault or something like that. So I'm just trying to take out the subjective part of being like, oh, look, I see a group of seismicity here that makes a line, right? Um, and then uh, once we have the seismicity, I'm interested in their fault characteristics. So uh, I will try to compile moment tensors, first motion focal mechanisms, um, things like that. So sometimes I calculate my own, sometimes I get them if they're available. Um, obviously for larger earthquakes, there's usually more of this type of information available. You might apply something like David Shelley's sort of waveform based focal mechanisms if you were wanting to, to get a lot for a smaller data set. And then uh, once I've sort of got the fault information and I can start to look at the spatial temporal information by doing the relocations, um, then the last piece is really the earthquake source physics. So uh, what I do uh, typically is apply the EGF analysis, but I've also started to work with um, like the spectral decomposition results that come out of like the Peter Shearer group or Daniel Trugman, um, that kind of thing. So. Uh, anytime you have a waveform, it's made up of all of these different parts, right? So it has the earthquake source, it has the structure or the velocity field, the path and the side effects, and then it has the instrument effect, you know, and some of these are easy to remove, some are not. So in order to investigate the source, you have to isolate it from these other parts of the waveform, and you would do this with deconvolution or spectral division. Um, and so the idea of the of removing this is using a Green's function, which would be based on the velocity structure. But what I do is use an empirical, screen, uh, empirical uh, Green's function or an EGF by assuming that a smaller earthquake that might be co-located uh, is basically acting like that point source um, or that delta function. And so this is a plot, I think, from like an intro book, maybe Shearer's, uh, which shows um, how corner frequency scales um, with uh, magnitude. And then obviously the amplitude here, the largest earthquake has the highest amplitude and, and the lowest is down here. So basically the EGF works by assuming that a smaller magnitude earthquake that's co-located has the same path and side effects, but its corner is so far beyond that the flat part of the spectrum can be used as the Green's function. And then um, we create these spectral ratios between events. We fit the corner frequency of the large event. And uh, using that, we can get rupture dimension or radius, and uh, we could cube it and get stress drop. So you can use it to get an estimate of the source. And theoretically, this stress drop that we're measuring is, is related to these pictures at the top of my mind, which would be about the rupture area or the slip over that area. But um, in reality, earthquakes are a lot more complicated than this. They have multiple pulses. And depending on if we're really getting the first pulse or the second pulse, or like the first corner or the second corner, you know, we might be measuring different things. So really uh, ground motion seismologists are interested in stress drop because it's getting that high frequency measure, you know, and that's related to ground motion. But if what we really want is like the slip of the largest pulse, um, then probably what we want is like the lower corner. So, you know, these all look simple, but in reality it's bumpy is, is what I'm saying. Um, and all of this is assuming just a really simpler, simple uh, circular uh, model that's um, symmetrical. Um, so here's some examples from my 2016 or I guess 2017 paper. So here are two earthquakes in the Mogul uh, sequence. The top one is this black target event, and then the red one would be the lower magnitude EGF. You can see it's a little bit higher frequency, but we uh, capture a window and then we apply a low pass frequency filter so that it will match well with the top event. And then we apply a cross correlation um, and a bunch of other uh, objective criteria. And then we try to fit the uh, corner frequency and we vary um, the corner by doing a grid search and get some uncertainties based on that. So this is the example for fitting one uh, ratio, but what we actually do is um, calculate, you know, uh, hundreds of these ratios and then we average them on a per station basis and then we average all the stations together. So we get a spatially averaged uh, stress drop. So if there was event directivity or something like that, theoretically we're sort of averaging it, um, averaging it out. And then again, from that corner frequency, which we've averaged, then we would go ahead and get rupture dimension and, and stress drop. And then the sort of last method or the second part is the spectral decomposition. And this is the new data that I'm gonna be showing. Um, and this essentially takes all of the small earthquakes in an area and calculates, uh, stacks them all up and creates like a depth varying um, uh, EGF. So then there's just like one or two or several for however many depths you have. EGFs, which will be used um, as event corrections for the target events, essentially. So this is a much uh, larger sort of batch approach, and um, you get a lot more re results, as I'm going to um, sort of show and compare. And then, oops, 
I guess, I don't know why I wrote 6B, I guess that's 4B, sorry. Um, and then once we have the source information, something else that comes out of the EGF approach that we apply is that we get source time functions. And again, um, these are azimuthally varying because we average them on each station. So this is showing on the right, some of our results again from Mogul with a magnitude three earthquake and all the source time functions with azimuth um, or direction on the Y axis. And so some of these are gonna be narrower, some are gonna be wider, and that's gonna be related to the rupture direction or the rupture pulse. So if an earthquake ruptures towards you, it's going to have a Doppler effect where it amplifies the high frequency uh, radiation in that direction. And basically the source time function is going to get squished. So it's higher amplitude and, um, and sort of a shorter frequency um, or higher frequency, shorter period. And then uh, these in the back direction, you would have this longer period and lower moment, right? So by looking at the variation of corner frequency um, or source time uh, duration, you can get at the 3D rupture directivity. So the way this works is with a line source and that line source is 3D. So we're not assuming horizontal directivity. And then we basically stretch all the source time functions until they're all the same width. So the red lines here plotted are the stretching uh, sort of factor how much it would need to be stretched in order to be the same exact width. And you use that to calculate the, the rupture direction. And by doing that, you can identify which fault plane ruptured. So for strike slip earthquakes, typically it makes a line and it's usually vertical, right? So it's easy to tell which one is which. But if we had normal faulting earthquakes where they had the same strike in different dips and the seismicity really didn't delineate or it was, you know, the, the dip very well, you could still identify uh, based on the up dip or down dip rupture direction direction, which plane was actually rupturing. So it does add an element there of, of confirmation. Um, so another way that I'm identifying fault planes is by applying this bootstrapping, uh, bootstrapping approach. So like I mentioned, I apply a clustering algorithm and I get all of these uh, clusters of seismicity. And then with each one of those clusters, I then apply a bootstrapping approach where it kicks out some of the, of the data. So you can see there's like some rogue events in this cluster over here, this green and um, orange one. And so it will randomly kick out some events and try to fit it. And it does that 500 times. And, um, and then I try to get the best fit. So this is actually for the mobile main shock, I think, um, using just the raw catalog. Uh, so this isn't with any relocations. And um, uh, these are all the bootstraps on a focal sphere uh, for the different fault planes and they're colored by uh, misfit or you know, how poorly it's fit by a fault plane uh, a fault normal distance. And then um, here is the dip with uncertainties that I've estimated on it and the strike with uncertainties. And then I just threw on the moment tensor to show you that uh, we're really close um, to the right strike and dip uh, within a couple of degrees, You know, basically the uncertainties that I have. So some of the results for the fault uh, measurements come out really well like this and other ones maybe not so much, especially the more horizontal it is or the worse the depths are, right? Then it's gonna end up fitting kind of just a horizontal plane. Um, so what we get out of this is the fault length and width, the strike and the dip, and then we also get the effect of stress drop because you can add up the moment of all the seismicity and divide it by the fault area. So we're starting to get again at the source physics or these sort of fault properties um, in a way. So, um, so now we're going to get into the good stuff. Let me take a sip of my coffee. So this is the ring out. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's Chris. Um, just got a quick question um, about so. You say in the last slide, you're gonna minimize fault normal distance. And that's mm -hmm. based on the idea that the fault should, you know, sort of the assumption that the fault should be kind of thin. Cause then you say you're gonna solve for fault width, but how, how do you decide, okay, so for how do you fault decide width, what the width should be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I hear what you're saying. So for width, I mean like the length and, and width, you know what I mean? So like that, it makes a, a planar square. So not the like into and out of width. That would be a very cool measurement to add to it. Actually, I should write that down. So you mean like how, what's the average amount that the seismicity is away from the plane basically would be like how, yeah, how wide right. the zone is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the zone has some finite. Yeah, you know, that would be really interesting, but I have not added that, but I easily could measure it, you know, because I'm doing it with the fault normal distance. So I assume they should all be on a plane. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. 
So these are some relocations. This label's wrong. Sorry about that. This is actually Stampede Reservoir, just like very smoothed out. So um, these gray lines are the quaternary faults in this area. You can see they're numerous, but again, the seismicity is not really occurring off of those faults. Uh, this, I think, is around 20 um, years of seismicity, and the colors uh, yeah, the colors are year. Okay, so this sort of green is the 2008 mogul swarm that I'm going to be talking about a lot. It was really shallow um, and occurred on, on an unknown fault. And then all of these other things are quite uh, small. Um, so the problem in this area and in a lot of the Walker Lane is the seismicity occurs on unknown faults. So what can we do about it? So I, you know, uh, applied my clustering algorithm and quantitatively identified spatiotemporal clusters within here because you can obviously see, okay, this blue is all the same color and it makes a line sort of, and it's separate from the other ones, right? So I'm trying to make the algorithm do what my brain would do. And so I break out these clusters and then I apply the fault plane algorithm, which can also get dipping structures. So this one, you can see it has some dip, it's shallower uh, to the west and deeper, these reds to the east. And um, and so we try to fit them. So I fit this fault plane and now you can sort of see with the dashed line that it has a bit of a, it's dipping, right? So it's not just a line and the bootstraps all look quite nice for this one and I fit it and then we look at the results. So what you can do with this type of thing, most of the faults are pretty small. So a geologist or a seismic hazard person might be like, wow, could we put these as input into seismic hazard, you know? But most of the fault lengths in seismic hazard, at least in the PSHA in, in the US, have to be 10 kilometers, I think, in length. So this is really too short, okay? We're looking at 10 kilometers here, and, you know, even mobile is only maybe like six or something, or five. So it's really not good as direct input, although on a larger scale, obviously, you could apply this and maybe do do that. But what I think uh, is interesting here is that it shows what the subsurface geometry looks like, and you can compare that to the surface geometry. And you can see which places it matches and which places it doesn't. Another thing that you can do with this type of information is think about the connectivity or the fault fracture meshes that connect faults. And I'm going to make the case when I show you the Monte Cristo data that this is a serious issue in these areas where we're having, you know, moderate earthquakes and magnitude six and a half isn't a joke, you know, and for that to happen on an unmapped fault that is basically just connecting mapped surface faults, that's important to know. And if we knew something about the activity prior or the connectivity in that area, something about the geometries, it could help with seismic hazard or could help with real time assessment when clusters sort of start up. Um, so I think that's mostly what I wanted to say about this slide. Um, so one other way that we can get at the fault geometry and move beyond just thinking about this uh, sort of as a static problem is to get into the dynamics. So another method um, or approach of visualizing this that I've developed is looking at um, sort of these 4D stereo net plots. So um, this is uh, data from Mogul Swarm and what, we've, what I did was I broke out the clusters, okay? So we're looking at one cluster of seismicity, and this cluster of seismicity had some foreshocks and it had some aftershocks and it had a, and it had a main shock, which I'm just calling the largest magnitude in that, in that cluster. So the main shock or the largest magnitude is this magnitude 2.5, and it's plotted in the center of the focal sphere, and its focal mechanism, which was calculated independently, is plotted, where the black are the lower hemisphere, that's what you're typically used to looking at, and then the gray is the upper hemisphere. The reason I plot both the black and the gray is because um, our directivity, again, is 3D, and so sometimes it goes into the lower hemisphere or the upper hemisphere. So to be able to tell if it's on the plane, you need both. So in this first plot, these squares are showing the four shocks for this event, and you can see that they're perfectly aligned on the fault plane. So that would imply, okay, this earthquake probably is you know, on this uh, northwest, northeast striking fault plane, right? And then in the second one, I plotted the rupture direction with our uncertainties. And so it's this X, and you can see that it's more or less in the northeast direction. And within 5%, it's more or less lining up on the fault plane. And then we look at the aftershocks, and uh, most of the aftershocks are occurring, again, on that same fault plane, but in the back direction. So now all of these individual pieces of evidence are, are supporting that we've identified this small fault plane, and that, uh, uh, you know, the rupture is towards the foreshocks and all these aftershocks are in the back direction. So you can start thinking about actually um, a sort of aftershock productivity or hazard as far as uh, what that has to do with the direction and, and things like that. So you can sort, sort of get into dynamic questions, um, which I haven't uh, 
sort of dove into all that much yet, but I think it's really interesting. So these are two examples of other clusters um, in the mobile sequence. Um, the one on the right, let me start with first, this is a magnitude 3.04 shock. It was pretty uh, simple and sort of average stress drop. If you look at it in map view, then the seismicity is all aligned to the Northwest and the rupture direction is to the Northwest. So the horizontal rupture direction and the, and the horizontal sort of uh, liniment is aligning and telling us it's the Northwest fault plane. Um, and uh, what I guess I'm trying to make the point about is that you need to look at it in more than just 2D uh, and really more than just 3D because it's a 4D problem here. And if you look at the stereo net plot, you can see most of the seismicity is on the lower hemisphere. Um, is on this sort of lower hemisphere projection of the fault plane, but the rupture direction was sort of up, uh, up dip. Um, so it's this X here with this uncertainty. And if you look at it in cross section, you can see that the uh, seismicity is also uh, sort of dipping and um, aligned with that. So this one's not my best example, but a lot of times I can see that the plane, the rupture direction is maybe 60 degrees dipping and so is all of the seismicity. So the confirmations here are really remarkable. Another interesting thing, I guess, regarding dynamics is in this left plot, here's a magnitude 3.14 shock that was very, very high stress drop. And it was part of this really large uh, cluster that happened um, uh, as, the, as the events accelerated into the main shock, um, maybe two days before the main shock happened. And as you can see in the cross sections, the fault is sort of kinked here and complicated. And in this along fault cross section here, uh, what I'm trying to show, this event is rupturing here in that direction. And, and basically, if you followed this in a movie, which I don't have time to show, you can see that the ruptures sort of make this figure eight around these sort of patches, okay? Sort of these seismicity voids. So to me, this is implying that the rupture direction is being controlled or again, is getting at these fault properties. Something's going on on this fault plane or in this fault zone that's causing the rupture directions and the seismicity to happen in certain places. So all of this is getting at the idea that the seismic observations, these small magnitude earthquakes are telling us they're probing the fault surface and telling us something about it. So um, those are just sort of some examples. And now I'm going to get into some detail of a couple of studies and then again, relate it back to Italy a little bit. So this swarm I keep talking about uh, happened in 2008. It had two months of four shocks that were really complex. They were on multiple structures, as you can see with these focal mechanisms in the bottom right. Um, and then this is colored by time. So all of these reds started in this off fault, fault fracture mesh, and then it moved on to the main shock fault plane, which is this yellow thing. And then the white is a geodetic fault plane model. And once it jumped on there, it accelerated over a couple of days into this magnitude five main shock. The magnitude five main shock went off and then um, all these aftershocks happened all around it. Um, and so one of the reasons that this sequence is so interesting is because it was extremely shallow. So all of the events, these focal mechanisms I'm showing are in the top five kilometers of the crust. So we're talking about a very, very shallow sort of incipient fault zone that is not mapped at the surface. So now the quaternary faults are plotted in red, and you can see that none of these match the alignment of the of the seismicity that we see. And another thing that makes it special is that it's 10 kilometers uh, west of the uh, Nevada Seismological Laboratory. So they were able to put out all these uh, temporary instruments, 13 temporary instruments that you see in the map. Um, and they're sitting right on top of the sequence. So the relocations and the data for the sequence are incredibly high resolution because the uh, vertical uncertainty is actually less than the horizontal uncertainty because of the aperture of so many events sitting right on top of it. Um, and then uh, I calculated over a thousand focal mechanisms. Uh, here, the blues are showing strike slip and all of the oranges are showing normal faulting. So you can see that this individual sequence has a significant amount of normal faulting in it and oblique faulting is green. So there's also some of them. Um, some that are kind of in between. And this is very common for the Walker Lane. We often get these transtensional sequences that have two different, like a fault plane that's normal combined with a strike slip. Um, so that's sort of the overview. And what I'm interested in uh, is the stress drops here. So I looked at stress drops uh, as part of my PhD and published it just after in 2017 using the EGF analysis that I went over. And what we found is that the stress drops, like almost every stress drop study, vary almost two orders of magnitude. So it's a huge amount of variation. And we did this study really carefully with really good data. And what we want to know is why is there variation? Is it real? Why does it exist? 
So these are two examples of magnitude 3 or 3.1 earthquakes. So these are the same size earthquakes, and they have very different uh, corner frequencies. So these two um, spectral ratios that we're looking at would never be measured with the same corner frequency and would never have the same stress drop. And if you look at even just the raw waveform data, you can see that this top one is a little bit lower frequency. There's more space between the pulses, right, than this high frequency event or this high stress drop event. So they really are radiating different levels of energy. And, and what does that actually mean? So when you look at an along fault cross section for this data, I had about 150 results. I did it independently for P waves, which is these uh, bottom two left columns, and then separately for S waves. So the data didn't overlap here. And in both of them, you can see that there's a pretty good correlation. You know, the main shock is high in both of these, though the aftershocks are on the bottom, and then the middle is the foreshocks. What you can also see is that uh, where the densest ring of foreshock activity is, this really dark, uh, all these black events are foreshocks, and this yellow ring, I'm trying to highlight that there's a dense ring of foreshocks there. And that's where we have the most high stress drop foreshocks happening. We have this big, big ring of high stress drop foreshocks. So in my paper, I suggest that basically this seismicity void could have maybe been a slip patch in the, in the main shock or maybe in the foreshock period. And um, all of these foreshocks are concentrating around it, kind of making a mogi donut, like I showed in the beginning, but at a smaller scale. And that that's related to this high stress radiation around the edges, okay, where we're having a transition maybe between a patch that's really locked, it didn't want to rupture, so it waited until the big earthquake and all these sort of foreshocks that happened around it. And then you can see an interlocking pattern in the aftershock period. There's no seismicity really where that uh, where that high stress drop foreshock ring was. And then the other areas where there's low stress drop foreshocks, there's a lot more aftershock activity. So this um, was an interesting pattern that we sort of wanted to investigate more and to confirm. So what we did was calculate 4,000 more results. So this is uh, the same fault plane and uh, the colors here yeah, sorry, the color scale changes. So the ye yellows are high stress drop and the purples and oranges are lower stress drop. And uh, again, these are just uh, four shocks on the left and after shocks on the right. So what do we see here? Well, immediately you can see, um, again, there's a lot of yellows around this ring and then the seismicity void inside, right? So there's less events in here and then high stress drops around it. So immediately we can confirm that spatial pattern uh, that I saw in my 2017 paper. Another interesting thing that we observe is that uh, the aftershocks which do occur in that same sort of area are also high. So that's interesting. The high areas of stress drop on the fault plane before the magnitude five main shock are also high stress drop after the main shock. What that's telling me is that the spatial variation here is significantly more than the temporal variation. And that, that magnitude five main shock didn't really change the fault properties that much if these stress drops are probing the fault surface and the fault properties. And if you look down here, these are all up sort of purples and oranges, uh, like under the six here. And the same is true in the aftershock period. So again, the temporal changes are not significant. There's less events here. Okay, after the four shocks. So the number of events is changing, but the actual stress radiation on average is the same in different parts of the fault plane. So this is the same event in map view, and uh, these are the four shocks. Um, these are the aftershocks. So the main shock is this star, and I'm just trying to again show there's more yellows to the northwest and then more pinks and oranges to the southwest, and that's true for both of these uh, data sets. So the spatial variation is significant, and now I have my scale on here, so sorry about that again, but the temporal variation um, is not as significant. And if we look at a couple of uh, zoomed in areas of these uh, aftershocks, I can point out a couple of other interesting things. So one of them is that this little aftershock fault plane, which looks really beautiful. I mean, come on, all these focal mechanisms match up. The line matches up really nicely. And they're all different colors, right? Why are these all different stress drops? Why are they radiating different frequency? What does it mean, you know? This is not related to the fault geometry, you know? The stress drop is not related to the stress regime and just the fault orientations, you know? It's not that some are optimally oriented or not. So what uh, that tells me is that this is really not just related to the stress field or um, sort of the earthquake part, it's related to the fault uh, itself. Maybe the, the roughness of the fault, the amount of fluids in the fault, um, the coupling of it, something like that. 
uh, maybe geology, different geology across the fault. This is mostly granites. There's some volcanics in this area. If you're interested in what the geology is like here, there's also a river that goes through. So some alluviums in the very shallow part. Um, and then uh, this other picture I put on here because this is the off fault fault fracture mesh to the Northwest. And uh, it has these down dropped and echelon faults. These are all the same orientation. Uh, these little uh, left lateral faults, but they're all different colors again. So I'm just trying to show, I haven't done a statistical sort of analysis on this, but I can, I have a thousand focal mechanisms and I have stress drops for most of them. So I could, I could hopefully prove it to you statistically, but uh, preliminarily, I think that um, we can say that the stress drop variation is not related to the fault orientation in any sort of simple way. And uh, so this, again, sorry, my color scale changed. So now the high stress drops are these reds and uh, yellows, and then the low stress drops or the moderate stress drops are sort of the yellow, grays, and blues. And um, this is the mogul sequence again on the top left. And uh, like I mentioned, I did the fault plane fitting and the clustering. So the plot on the right um, is showing our fault plane analysis. The numbers are the dips of those faults. So uh, some of these ones here are sort of dipping to the uh, west, as you can see in the cross sections, A to A prime and B to B prime. And they're colored uh, by stress drops. So this would imply these sort of off fault ones are like blues, right? They're lower stress drops. And then for whatever reason, this uh, this part over here where we have our aftershocks, you know, is coming out as higher effective stress drop. So how do the effective stress drops compare to the stati static stress drops, you know, that we're actually measuring for individual events and things like that? That's another line of reasoning or analysis that we could follow and, and that I just haven't um, had time to yet. And in the bottom here, again, it's showing this significant spatial variation. And also what I like about this is that it highlights the highest stress drops are happening around this kink in the fault. So the fault plane is kinked both in depth and in, in strike. Uh, so the main shock happens at sort of the double kink in the fault plane where it changes strike and where it changes dip. And you can see that that area has the most high stress drops in this sort of kinked area. So um, just think about that. Um, so I think I've said all of the text that's on here, but the idea is that the, the spatial variation is so much. And to me, that suggests that it's uh, related to the fault properties that may be really enigmatic or difficult to actually measure. Um, so I'm going to move on to some preliminary results for Monte Cristo range earthquake. Uh, this is a larger magnitude and it also has significant fault complexity. Um, I haven't gone yet to do the stress drops. That's what we're working on right now with some USGS funding. Um, uh, but the preliminary results are pretty cool anyway. So this uh, was a 6.5. It happened um, in a pretty rural area down here, but it did cross a, a highway and um, broke that highway a little bit. So you can see some pictures here. So there was some surface damage um, and some surface rupture from this, but the surface rupture was really small and it was really complicated. Um, so these are the relocations for the earthquakes from just the NSL raw catalog. So uh, on the top left is the moment tensor and um, uh, a stress inversion of all of the moment tensors that we have, which I think is like about 120, and they're also plotted here. Um, and you can look at the moment tensors and see that the main shock is this probably this left lateral fault because of the liniment of most of the seismicity. But then if you look at the actual moment tensors of most of the aftershocks, you can see, especially with these green ones, right, there's a lot of normal faulting. And then we have normal faulting with some strike slip mixed in. We have mostly strike slip over here. And then we have a lot of normal faulting and strike slip on the east end as well. So uh, this is in an area of the minor deflection. I showed it on the first plot. Um, we have this sort of down dropped basin here, which is the, um, the Columbus salt marsh, which is dashed by this uh, dashed circle here or ellipse. And then um, the Candelaria fault zone CFZ is over here. And that's a left lateral fault zone, which is presumably what this is, a, is an extension of in the subsurface. And then uh, this uh, PSFS is the Petrified Springs fault zone, which is a right lateral um, uh, northwest striking fault where it continues up to the north. So basically this thing ruptured from the mapped extent of the Candelaria fault zone over to the uh, Petrified Springs fault zone and, and up. And um, you can see it's really wide and diffuse. And so what's going on and why are there so many different moment tensors? That's the sort of thing we were looking at. So we calculated relocations and that's what's plotted here. Um, so immediately you can see they're cleaned up quite a bit and they're colored by depth. 
So because the colors vary so much, you can see that the structure is probably pretty complex. Um, I also have the moment tensors on here still, and this green line is the geodetic fault plane estimated by Hammond and others. Um, and so you can see my location matches quite well with the geodetic fault plane. So I think that's something that's really important. When you do relative relocation studies, you need to make sure that um, if you're trying to relate it to the geology and stuff, that you have it in a good absolute location. So you need to sort of ground truth it or um, do some careful analysis initially to get, um, to, oops, sorry, to, to get an accurate location. So, um, Right. So on the uh, on this plot, I also have the surface faults, uh, surface fault zones, um, which are plotted. So some of these show normal displacement, some of them show right lateral displacement, and some of them show left lateral displacement. But all of it is very small um, and distributed, and some of them are just uh, sort of fracture zones where it's not really measurable, measurable displacement, just uh, break breaking. Um, so obviously, most of them are concentrated again on this Candelaria fault zone extension, which is pretty nice. And you can see that it abuts my uh, shallowest seismicity. So that would imply that this fault is maybe dipping towards the southeast and is rising up towards the, the rupture and projects up to these surface ruptures here. And then along the actual uh, geodetic fault plane and where most of the seismicity is, you can see these sort of north striking crossing faults, right? So most of those actually show normal and right lateral displacement. And I think this one over here off the end is a really clear right lateral fault. Um, so it's really complex uh, and distributed, and the geologists are really confused on why uh, this, this moment tensor says it should be a left lateral through going thing, and none of these are really showing that. So if you look at the cross sections here, um, uh, this is the long fault one on the top. Um, the main shock here showing the left lateral to back hemisphere projection, and most of the seismicity is concentrated there. But again, it's concentrated in these bands with gaps in between, which imply that this is really a multiple fault rupture. It's really not a smooth fault plane. And if you look at the across fault cross sections, again, here we'll look. Okay, so B to B prime goes across this really uh, narrowest part, C to B, C prime goes obliquely across this way, and then D to D prime is across the, the northeast um, end. And so where I'm crossing the geodetic fault basically right here east of where it says 10. Um, the moment tensors at depth, uh, these purple ones, align really nicely with the moment tensor fault plane and with each other and show a vertical left lateral strike slip fault. But once we get to a depth of round five, that really nice coalesced plane becomes more diffuse and it starts flowering or branching out in multiple directions. And if you follow the branch to the northwest, you eventually get to those surface ruptures. So the seismicity does project up to the surface ruptures, but it certainly doesn't connect to it uh, the way that I guess we dream it would. Um, one of the reasons for that probably is because the seismicity in the shallowest portion is the worst located um, and uh, probably was also some of the earliest seismicity is also you in a time plot in a minute. Um, and so there weren't temporary seismic stations out for, for that part of the sequence. Um, so we didn't uh, have any foreshocks here. So unfortunately, like the main shock and some of the early sequence isn't really recorded on that. And then in these other cross sections, you can start to see uh, more complicated structures and multiple structures, some dipping at depth, things like that. Um, the only thing I really want to point out in this plot is this figure D, which is the aftershock decay. And this sequence had a much higher aftershock decay than what we would expect. Um, so uh, because of the sort of high productivity of the aftershocks, um, I'm, I'm sort of relating that to the fault complexity. So if we think that this swarm like Mogul happened because it has so much complex faulting, and then we had this two months of sequence happening because it was sort of organizing or rupturing all these little faults, then I think you could apply that same sort of logic to this aftershock sequence that we have this really productive aftershock sequence and maybe that's related to the fault complexity. Another interesting preliminary observation here is if you look at the along crawl, along fault cross section and you sum up the uh, seismicity, so the number of events, and then you look at the actual cumulative moment, there's a sort of anti-correlation. So most of the seismicity is happening in the complex area where we have those normal faults and these n echelon things towards the west and then most of the moment is actually happening towards the east um, on the on these like uh, right lateral um, faults that we're seeing so uh, again maybe this is related the number of events is related to where it 
where it didn't slip or something like, I don't know. So it's sort of getting at that idea. And uh, also uh, there's reason to believe that this earthquake ruptured multiple faults in its initial rupture so that it was a complex uh, thing. So one of the pieces of evidence here is how many of these faults were activated within a day of the main shock. So the color scale here, this lightest pink is all within 24 hours or one day of the main shock. And if you look in the map view, you can see everything is pink, right? So the whole fault system was activated uh, pretty much immediately. And if you look at our cross sections, you can see that that's also true. Um, and again, I'm highlighting with these ellipses some other places where the seismicity is projecting up to the surface fracture areas and stuff like that. And then also I have the geodetic fault plane on here matching pretty well. Um, and uh, the IPGP source time function for this also has multiple pulses, like three or four uh, bumps actually. So that also is another piece of evidence that suggests this is a multiple fault complex rupture. So, you know, for Mogul, nobody cares that much if it ruptured multiple faults. It's a magnitude 4.9. But now it's getting more interesting. We're looking at a 6.5. And of course, when you get up to things like Kaikoura, which was a 7.8 and ruptured a lot of different faults, it has more relevance, you know? So looking at these and creating a database of fault complexity and thinking about how many faults an earthquake can actually rupture is a really important question. So to overview, like we've inferred that these shallow aftershocks are um, rupturing throughout the system and highlighting these fault fracture meshes, which connect the map surface fault systems to these left lateral faults at depth. So um, basically the seismicity is doing the work or telling us the story of how this left lateral vertical fault at depth is connecting to what, what we see at the surface. Um, and so, although, you know, it's not direct connection, it does tell us something about how the structure is working. Um, and it also implies that it's really immature and that it does not extend to the surface and that the slip at depth is probably distributed over uh, multiple faults and then it's distributed really widely. So that has implication at, at the surface. And so if you're trying to do seismic hazard by going out and doing paleo seismology or looking at fault ruptures, and this magnitude 6.5 is not being captured by the surface faults because everything is going to get washed away when it rains, right? It was all really small, that tells you something about the missing information in seismic hazard analysis. And then um, based on our interpretation and the waveforms and everything, we think this was a multiple fault rupture, but more work would need to be done by that. So it begs the question about sort of self-similarity, and it brings me back to this sort of bigger picture question of, you know, is fault complexity or these types of observations that we can see at a small scale, do they apply at a large scale? You know, and I really like this picture um, from Alex Schubnell's work, which shows these four shocks in one of his lab experiments. And then I think this dashed ring is basically like the area of the inferred rupture eventually, like when there was too many four shocks to, to, to account for. So to me, this again implies that like it's building up, it basically has to rupture a bit and then it, and then it can go, um, you know, and then I see it in Mogul and Ridgecrest. And then these are kind of Mogul's work with some, some donuts and stuff originally. Um, so the last bit, I'm just going to quickly show a couple of slides comparing the Walker Lane with Italy. So I'm working on an NSF proposal um, to submit to basically look at the clustering and the faulting properties of this. So actually the Walker Lane and, um, and Central Italy Seismic, seismicity have a lot in common. They're both areas of structural complexity um, that's sort of being overprinted or overwritten, right? So this is a lot of uh, reverse faulting that's now being over, overprinted with, uh, with extension or it's changed regimes. And in here we had the basin and range extension, which is now being uh, transformed, right? So it's being, uh, it has strike slip that it has to accommodate. And so uh, obviously you guys probably all know about this 2016, 2017 sequence, uh, which has some complex faulting and obviously complex sequence behavior with multiple sort of main shocks over several months. Um, and uh, to me, these are connected. It's just a larger scale seismic cluster. Um, so uh, these cross sections here are all uh, of the relocations. And then I'm just going to compare it again to like Giovanna Calderoni's preliminary work looking at um, stress drops uh, for the area. So a lot of times because of the uncertainties, um, you know, you would look at stress drops using multiple methods. So these are just two independent methods showing that they have similar patterns where the highest stress drops are sort of concentrated together in the central part. And if you look at the cross sections, then look at where the highest stress drops are happening, where we have these reds, those happen to be in the area is where we have the most complex geology uh, or complex faulting. So to me, that again implies that these stress drops are related directly to the complexity in the, in the fault geometries. 
Um, and I'll bring it right back uh, to Mogul. So why are the largest earthquakes and sequences complex? Um, and this is one of the uh, magnitude fours in the Mogul sequence. It ruptured to the Northwest. Uh, oh, sorry, no, it ruptured to the Southwest, Southeast, uh, this direction. And um, it had all of these uh, earthquakes associated with it statistically. And you can see that uh, the seismicity over here is aligning on this sort of east-west uh, or northeast striking structure. And most of the seismicity is there, but this thing is sort of rupturing to the southeast. So to me, that implies uh, that it probably ruptured both of these things um, or pulled apart this sort of little extensional feature at the same time that it was rupturing right laterally. And um, uh, the stress drop for this thing is, is sort of average or to high, and then the source time function and the uh, spectral ratios look really complex, right? So they're very bumpy, um, and there's multiple pulses in the source time function. So it's implying, again, that it, it you know, we're, we're directly relating the complex fault geometry using the statistics and the relocations to the source physics, which I think is interesting. And for the main shock, like I mentioned, it occurred at the intersection of sort of uh, sort of at the kink of two of these faults as if it's like a doubly kinked fault um, and you had a piece of paper that you folded in half both ways right and so it sort of initializes here at the middle of this um, sort of orange cross and if you look at the seismicity that's statistically associated with the main shock then we have this sort of m shape in the shallow part and then it kind of comes around the bottom and leaves these patches that you see in this patch i talked about where the high stress drop foreshock circle is this p1 i have labeled and uh, again, if you look at the source time function, it's got multiple pulses, at least like two or three sort of bumps in it. So, you know, is there evidence here that it was a multiple fault rupture, you know, again, at a smaller magnitude? So the problem is sort of the fault modeling for these earthquakes. Like for the, to really finish this puzzle, you would need to do a slip inversion using multiple faults and the observations like the geodetic observations or even the seismic observations for that just aren't there for this magnitude 4.9. But maybe they are there for the magnitude 6.5 five or for some of these larger magnitude sequences. So that's the kind of work that I've been doing. And, you know, I'm, I know this probably was a little overwhelming if you're not familiar with a lot of these things already, but I'm basically trying to give an overview of this quality of data and suggest that we should be looking at it in a lot more resolution and thinking about the connection between these. And I think that's going to take people from different organ, different sort of branches or expertise coming together and, uh, and cataloging it, you know, and to me, it's a really fascinating uh, story. So so that's where I'll end. If there's any questions or discussion, I'm happy to stay on. All right, fabulous. Thank you so much, Christine. Everyone, please um, unmute long enough to uh, yeah thank thank Christine for a fabulous talk.